Officer down! I repeat, officer down! Welcome back to 1033. This is your host, Nathan Kapler. A podcast created for a first responder by a first responder. If you are not a first responder, you still are welcome. This podcast is aimed directly at trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is complex and often misunderstood. Our brave men and women who serve our communities often end up with behavioral and psychological issues as a result of experienced trauma from their careers. My goal is to share what I know my personal experience with PTSD as a retired police officer and continue to advocate for mental health while providing support to those still in their careers. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical help and I strongly suggest if you are in fact suffering, you seek out professional medical advice. Please join me on this episode as I continue to expose the reality of PTSD challenges. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to 1033. Today, I have a special guest with me, Jay Anderson. Jay Anderson comes to us with over 20 years of RCMP experience. He has recently retired as of last year, and he has now catapulted his life into giving back to first responders. He has a social work master's education behind him, and he is geared towards taking what he's learned about post-traumatic stress and giving back to those that have served and helping the world become a better place. Jay, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's an honor to finally drill you down. Uh, we have both been very elusive in our own <laughs> lives, busy, busy, busy as it goes. So I think we've been scheduled to do this a few times and now we're finally sitting down. So I'm a pretty excited guy to uh, finally have your time and to just kind of get your your experience and where, where everything went for you in your journey. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, how your journey began, maybe pre-Mountie, kind of what you were doing, and then we'll jump into uh, what life was like as a Mountie? Sure. So I um, started my, my career, or I guess my adult career, when I was uh, in university, I was approached by a, a friend of mine who suggested that maybe I might be a good fit for a, a treatment center that he worked at. So I, I applied and shortly thereafter got the job. And that was the, the start of my adult working life. And I kind of spent the next six and a half years at a place called Marymound in Winnipeg. It was a residential treatment center for adolescent girls uh, between the ages of uh, 12 and 17. That was kind of my eye opener to uh, the helping profession, getting hands on and kind of, you know, in working with people that way. Um, did that for like I said, six and a half years and then transitioned into working with another friend at a business that was set up for dealing with that same population of kids when they were in the, let's say, 19 to 21 year uh, time frame. They were out of care, independently living, and now trying to move their life kind of forward even further, getting involved with employment. So my official title was uh, employment counselor at that point. Uh, did that for a number of years and then decided once I got my degree, it was time to finally transition and do the regular social work thing and put my time in as a uh, child protection worker. I worked uh, two different parts of it. I did emergency after hour service. So when you think of social workers and child protection, the ones that go to the hospitals or homes and do the apprehensions in the late hours of the evening, uh, that's what I did for, you know, that position. But then during my daytime hours, I was uh, an abuse investigator. So I solely investigated uh, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse cases that were brought in uh, to Winnipeg Child and Family Services, do the initial investigation, kind of package it up and, and assign it to the proper resources from that point on. Then I got that big phone call that uh, we all get at some point and uh, had an offer that uh, I couldn't refuse at the time. So and what was that beautiful phone call that you got? Well, I think it, I think if my memory serves me correctly, it went something like, uh, Mr. Anderson, we have a position for you in Troop 28 of 2000, 2001 that will start on October 20th. Are you interested in attending depot? And that was it. The answer said yes. And, uh, my life quickly changed as I had about two and a half weeks to get everything ready and prepared to venture off into a new world. 
everything happened so fast. That phone call is pretty amazing though. I know even from my own experience, when I finally got that call, how proud I was. Now, did you, did you prior to, did you have your sights set on be becoming a Mountie? Yeah, it was actually, uh, uh, it's my childhood dream, believe it or not. It was one of those ones that I can honestly trace back to an exact moment. I was about uh, five or six years old living uh, in Winnipeg <clears throat> and I was over at my neighbor's house playing and this c- police car showed up in front and it was a different color than the Winnipeg City Police. It was uh, the blue and white, the old blue and white with the uh, gumball up top. And the crest was different. The guy got out and it was uh, the old brown uniform of the day, uh, but still had that yellow stripe, which was completely different than Winnipeg City Police. So he came in to uh, take a statement from my neighbor who was involved in an accident on the highway. And I was so kind of taken by this this uh, police officer when he came in. I actually ran home, like next door, changed into a suit and came back to meet him. And he noticed that I came back wearing a suit as a a small little six-year-old and he spent about 20 minutes talking to me, 15, 20 minutes, just answering questions, kind of showing me different things on his, on his uniform, on his duty belt. And that was it. That captivated me. Um, And at that point I knew like at some point in my life, I'm going to be that guy. And then again, when I was, uh, I think 12, we were visiting family in Regina and we went and did the RCMP depot tour. And it was at the end and we're sitting in the, um, the chapel. And I remember sitting beside my mom and I looked at her and I said, you know, one day you're going to be here for my graduation. And she said, well, you know, if that's, if that's what happens, that's what happens. And then sure enough, you know, fast forward another 16 years and they were there for my graduation. That's so cool. That's a really cool story. How it all came to be. That's awesome. Uh, you see so your journey now, obviously you're very proud to get that phone call, uh, in your childhood dream now is finally coming together. You're off to depot now for your 20 years of service. We won't spend too, too much time on kind of where you were sections and all that stuff, but you had told me that you started out in Manitoba in 2001 and, uh, and what were some of the things that you started to see now, uh, shift within you now from, how you recognized who the person you were prior to your service now going into serving your community and some of the trauma you may have experienced. What were some of those shifts you started to see now? Well, I think right off the bat, like my first posting was in Shamatawa up in Northern Manitoba. And I, you know, it was my first set of calls, uh, first day working, first set of calls, went to a house for uh, what was considered uh, a drinking related call we go into the house and, you know, there's a baby in the crib with the sniff rag that was kind of thrown off on the corner of the crib, no parents around. And my first instinct at that point was, holy crap, you know, we should, uh, we need to call the police or we, yeah, we need to call the police to help us, you know, cause this is going to be, you know, we have to apprehend this kid. And then I look down at my shoulders and sure enough, I have the, the shoulder you know, badge that says you're the cop now. So it, it was, you know, first shift, first day, quick realization. I'm no longer in Kansas. I'm not a, I'm not a social worker anymore. My role is completely different. So that was kind of the genesis of kind of the change and realizing things are different. There is a very real transition too that happens. I know even in training when we're there, we're doing our training and we're getting used to this idea of we now are a police officer, we're trying to pretend to be one. And then when you go to the field and you have that first call and you're faced with that real first big challenge, you kind of look around like, okay, who do I call for this? Because I'm a fish out of water and then you're you're it. Mm-hmm. What's a sniff yeah, rag? You- Sorry, I've never heard this term before. A sniff rag, it's basically a rag that is doused in some type of a chemical. Uh, this happened to be kind of a, a gas rag that was thrown in. So the fumes would actually kind of calm the child and, and knock them out in some ways so that the oh, parents no could way. go out. No way. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate part. So that's um, that's the way the world unfortunately turns for some people. They do these kind of things to each other, which is... Uh, which is, I mean, trauma, right? These are the things we see. So what what kind of person were you like going into the Mounties, Jay? Like, how would you describe yourself? Um, for the most part, I, I think I kept a lot of the same because I went in at 28, right? So I, I wasn't like I was didn't have a lot of background experience beforehand. Um, 
I had dealt with some pretty difficult situations work-wise before joining the Mounties and, and, you know, my, my time in child protection and even as a youth care worker. So there's lots of things that I was, uh, I was able to draw. I'm not sure I changed too much personality wise outside of the job. Of course, on the job right away, there's that transformation where, you know, there's definitely a separation or that you try to put a separation between yourself on shift versus off shift. And that definitely started progressing, you know, that, that armor that you start putting on that kind of protection that you start collecting for yourself. The, uh, so some of the things that you were seeing now as a Mountie, uh, would you say that they were more intense? Was the trauma different than your previous role? Uh, now how, and how was that impacting you? Right off the bat, I noticed that, yeah, the, the level of violence that you're exposed to um, increased dramatically. And with that level of violence, of course, you have the aftermath of that violence, whether it be, you know, what someone did to themselves because of the violence or, you know, to other people or things that they would just do. Um, so, you, you know, I definitely noticed that that was starting to, to change. But one of the bigger things that I noticed is that even though you're on your RFT or your training and you have a, um, a, a training officer with you or you are left on your own, um, you know, you go through a situation. I think of some of the, the situations I went through in the first uh, couple of months of my service and you're left to process it yourself. There's no, no talking about the incident afterwards you just kind of start moving call to call and that's, you start kind of building up that process of not dealing with stuff or not processing stuff and just putting it on the back burner. And by the time you have a chance to actually look at the stuff, you've got so much back there that it just, you know, you just don't even bother. You just keep on going. Was there one incident for you that uh, stands out as kind of uh, the one big one for you that was very, very challenging? Do you want to share that one, Jay? In my entire career or, or kind of the first little while? Yeah, whatever. Well, for, for me, I had one one incident where it was one of those life or death incidents where it definitely shook me. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering if there was something out there for you that stands out as probably, you know, that front runner, uh, most biggest impact that came from a, a traumatic call. I'm just wondering if you can share that with people just to kind of paint a picture of some of the stuff that we go through. You know, there's, uh, I can go through kind of a couple of them and I'll, I'll give more of a generic kind of overview view. and you'll see how the, you know, trauma is not, and I think that's one of the key things. There's different types of trauma that we experience, right? These big T trauma moments that most police officers are getting involved with is the one thing, right? And, and those we tend to be able to process and handle a lot better because they're so big. So, you know, all the resources get thrown at them or, you know, you have the, the, the corporal give you a little chat afterwards, but then there's also these little T traumas that just kept on happening. So, you know, when I'm talking about the sniff rag and all those other kind of experiences, those are all those little T traumas that are just keeping on piling on to me through my career. But, you know, I I think in Shimadawa, it was uh, three and a half months, two and a half, three months of service. Uh, The Hayes river had just broken up. And we had someone that, uh, it's a dry reserve and they make homebrew up on dry reserve. And we found out about this individual in the bush. We start going to try to, to find him to seize the, uh, the moonshine he made. And instead of kind of giving up his, his pail of moonshine, he jumped into the river with it. And the Hayes river was just breaking up from the winter at this point. So there's ice flows going down. Um, and I remember watching him cause he's holding onto one of those, it's those big yellow kind of McDonald's thermos, uh, drink, um, things. And he's, he's bobbing down the river and eventually you know, it's so cold. He let that go and you just see him kind of going and the Hayes river is, is completely messed up depth wise because it can go from, you know, two feet to 20 feet and then back up to three feet in a matter of, you know, a 10 foot span almost. So he, he started losing it and you could see him kind of fading out. So I, I actually dove into the, to the river to, to go and grab him. And just before I grabbed him, I got hit by ice myself and knocked down under, got back up, grabbed him, pulled him to shore. So, you know, 
go through that. And the response to that at the end of it was, you know, go back to the uh, trailer, get cleaned up, put on clean clothes. We got more calls to do. So, you know, the, the mindset comes in right away that, you know, just keep on going. So there, there's that one, but then, you know, as you continue on your service, you start kind of getting into these situations over and over again. Uh, I look at, um, I was uh, a call one evening uh, when I was down in Winnipeg, Osa, so I was shot at twice uh, within the span of five minutes. And one of the uh, things that I always remember is the sound of a 303 rifle recoil and the bullet streaming past me. So, you know, that's another one and you just kind of keep on going. Um, then there's, uh, you know, witnessing a, a child death is, a you know, was probably the one that really pushed things over the edge, but it sat there and it didn't come out for a number of years. Like, and when I say it sat there, all these incidences just kind of were present um, and you just keep them and, you know, they, they come out when they're supposed to come out or when they want to come out. So you just continue to go on. I um, did a search warrant and holding a pipe bomb in my hand because I'm the exhibit custodian and I'm going through a, a package that uh, was brought for me to process and I'm going through and I'm holding a pipe bomb and I say, we have a bomb here. The sergeant who's controlling the scene, well, he was the first one out the door, leaving me holding the bomb, literally and figuratively. So I had to carefully put this pipe bomb back down and realize that there's a second pipe bomb and six sticks of dynamite. Um, and then clear the place out. And then I think the comment at the end of the day was, why don't you just put that outside so that the bomb techs could get at it easier. So no recognition again. And you just start going through these situations. Um, you know, there's so many that I could pull out of these moments that are life changing. You know, I, ha I have one of the big ones that I, you know, I guess two of the bigger ones that I, I dealt with uh, in therapy. One was, uh, that a hit was taken out on me. Um, I was brought into the staff's office and told me that, uh, because of my work, um, an individual took out a $25,000 hit on me. So it, you, you kind of go through that piece. And that, that one was probably the, the longest lasting one because it impacted on so many uh, parts of my life, including any, uh, involvement with social media or, or presenting and promoting myself that way. It was really hard to get over that. Uh, another one was uh, having to be at a point where, you know, I made that choice that potentially I would have to take a person's life uh, in the heat of the moment we were fighting. Um, and I remember kind of going through that whole process of, of realizing and reconciling it for myself that, it's one of those moments where it's either this other person or myself. And, you know, I was going to go home at the end of the day because that was a promise I made. So for me to pinpoint one exact thing, uh, you know, I, I know the one that brought all my PTSD out and, and I, I'll, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail because I think it's, it's a good message for people to realize that this doesn't unfold itself in a natural way. The incident doesn't happen. And then 72 hours later, you realize, Oh, I think I'm being affected by the stress. And then you seek out help. The, the progress of this stuff isn't that way. And, you know, there's a lesson to be learned in that, you know, the processing of it is one thing, making sure that you're settled with it is the other. My experience very similar to you as well, where I think, I think when I first got immersed into policing and I was always very conscious about the big trauma events, but it was, I was so focused on the big trauma that I forgot that the little trauma that I was seeing <clears throat> was also having an impact as well. And you talked a lot about that and that's very important because a lot of people look at PTSD and they go, Oh, what's the one, uh, one situation that, you know, just pushed you uh, beyond that point. And it, a lot of times is an accumulation of a lot of trauma over our experience, our careers, 
<clears throat> and it's how we're now trying to cope with that trauma. And you touched on this very, uh, very early on as you started to reflect on some of the incidents you had been through when you had dove into that river to try and save that man, which you did. Phenomenal job. You didn't get any, probably any recognition whatsoever, unfortunately, right? And this stuff should be recognized for our first responders. But needless to say, you then get thrust into this, okay, go home, dry off, come back out. We still need you. Mm -hmm. And that's the environment that you're now in, this pressure cooker environment. And that's, this is such a common theme that I see in the first responder world where we don't have enough supports in place so that, you know, after something like this, where you go through a traumatic experience, you can take some time. Maybe you want the shift off to go home and just kind of process what you just went through. Like you, you pushed the body into the max, like you almost sacrificed your life in order to save someone that night. Uh, and, and these events happen over and over over and over again. And that coping style for you, it sounds like you, would you agree with you started to suppress or uh, push down some of the more traumatic events or even the smaller traumatic events and try to deal with it later, but not necessarily ever came back to dealing with it? You know, yeah, a lot of it, you do kind of push down. And, and you know, one of the things I talk about with clients is, you know, it's this idea of the beach ball, right? You know, we're collecting these traumas or we go through these situations and it's like a beach ball that, that you're holding on to and you're trying to get rid of it by pushing it under the water. And you just keep on pushing it further and further down. The more, the bigger it gets, you're just pushing more and more. And eventually it comes up and it smacks you in the face because that's, you know, they, they don't treat, train us how to deal with not feeling okay. Right. They, they train us on doing everything else, but they don't train us on, okay, you just went through all these bad calls. How do you write your ship now? How do you kind of get yourself back on track? So we just keep on collecting them, right? We keep on suppressing them. We don't deal with them. And then, you know, I, I don't know, you were out in E division. Did you ever hear the term choir practice? No, I did not. No. Yeah bunch of Mounties get together, crack open the bottle and you have a choir. Oh practice. yes. No, I, I heard right? I, it, we call, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's, and that's, that unfortunately was a big theme, especially for you uh, going back to 2001, a lot of first responders cope through, uh, through alcohol abuse, right. Getting together, drowning your sorrows and uh, you know, classic. Well, I, I, I call it the uh, pressure cooker approach, right. Where, at some point, the pressure cooker has to let off some steam so that you can keep on going, right? Same thing with the Mounties, right? When you're when you're in those moments and you're going through shit call after shit call, you get to a point where you finally say, "Okay, we we gotta we gotta let loose a bit," and you let loose, and you get that kind of release, and you're able to keep on going and collect more, and then you have to have another release. It, it's the same kind of concept with trauma porn or, or kind of war porn where guys get together and they start off, Oh, how was your shift? And you, you start, Oh, did you hear about this one? And you start kind of one upping each other, right? Like who has the most grotesque story of a trauma that you've been to. And you think it, it's a, a release and it is to some, some ways it, it kind of lowers that pressure that you're feeling, but you're, you're just doing more trauma on each other. You're yeah. You're making the problem worse. It. Yeah. You're slinging it back and forth. Right. Yeah. And you're re-experiencing not only your own trauma in an unhealthy fashion, you're not processing it in a healthy fashion. Cause I think both you and I have both learned how to do that. Uh, but yeah, like you're, you're now bringing somebody else's trauma into your trauma and it's just adding to those layers of, uh, of the onion. Uh, and that's a great analogy too, of PTSD for the, the beach ball, pushing that beach, beach ball down as hard as you can trying to control it. And you will not win that battle. I can guarantee you it'll come up eventually at some point later on down the road even though you think you may have a good uh, control over it but great analogy now for you you're starting to see kind of how you're coping with the job and you're seeing that some of these issues are getting pushed down much like the beach ball what were you noticing as that beach ball was going down deeper and there was more trauma and now what's the impact to you jay you know i don't even know if i realized how big it was while it was going on it uh, or before it kind of broke out it just became such a natural process that you just kind of put stuff into the back burner right you, you're not dealing with it for me 
I started noticing some changes kind of work-wise, frustration levels picking up and kind of questioning, um, you know, why things are different. And part of it too was it was a real mess for me coming from D division to O division. So coming from Manitoba to Ontario, even though I did federal policing in, in Manitoba, it's not real federal policing as kind of they do in Ontario, different, different mindset, different approach to everything. And you start kind of getting, you know, for me, I was getting caught up in these differencing in policies or approaches. Like how can one organization have such vastly different, you know, mindsets and doing things. And and that became my struggle. And looking back on it now, that was the initial kind of opening of this because I couldn't make rhyme or reason of it anymore. And it it was definitely kind of the opening of the, the PTSD door just a little bit during my time in national security uh, same thing. Um, I look back on it now and there's definitely the door kind of opened up a little bit more. I started losing control on that beach ball. Um, it, it wasn't working the way that I thought it would. And I tapped out of national security. I, I couldn't, couldn't keep on doing it. You know, I, I cited the, the work-life balance aspect of it and driving, you know, an hour and a half one way each day uh, to get to the office that it was just getting too much for me and, and taking too much of a toll in hindsight it, it was my ptsd was coming out and going um but here you know we talk about it this is even though it's happening i'm denying it already at this point that it's just it's other things it's the work stress it's all these other pieces and i went on and i did a very successful file uh for an importation case and handled that as the uh as the primary without any concern or issue to a successful kind of ending and then got promoted stu- like on top of it so you know when we i say that ptsd just doesn't come out in this you know boom fantastical moment now you have ptsd it, it's a slow kind of erosion of what you have going on for you and for me it all culminated at a point where I was hitting my peak. I was moving into becoming a team commander for files. I was moving into getting that training to start kind of moving up the next ladder, step of the ladder. I was doing acting as a sergeant. Everything was kind of going my way. And I hop on a plane to go to a team commander's conference out in Chilliwack. And that's when I had my moment where the the realization came that this uh, this roller coaster ride is going to get a lot uglier than you ever thought possible. That happened uh, on the plane. That realization. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, I was flying with a, a coworker uh, from Toronto to Vancouver. So get on the plane and um, figuring I got I'm probably about eight rows back from my coworker. We weren't able to get uh, close to each other, which turned out to be a good thing. But I'm. Uh, Sitting there, I figure, you know what, I'll watch uh, American Sniper by Clint Eastwood because what could go wrong with a Clint Eastwood movie? And uh, there we are, like I'm up in the air, we're watching this. And it's the scene where Chris goes to the nursery when his first child is born. And he looks on the sea of babies in the nursery and sees his. I am bawling my eyes out. Uncontrollable. Uh, like tears are just running down my face. I don't know what is going on. It just, this is a Clint Eastwood movie. I'm not that emotional of a guy, but I, I'm balling, right? So I, I'm get myself composed, you know, get my eyes cleaned up and, you know, continue watching the movie because, you know, that, that Mountie mentality, right? Carry on, just keep on going. So keep on watching the movie. It must just be something, you know, maybe a bad sleep or whatever. And, another scene with a nursery or a a newborn child and I'm a mess again. And I don't know what's going on at that point. I am emotionally deregulated to the max. Um, Just as a second kind of incident is happening, the pilot's coming on saying, yeah, we're about a half hour outside of Vancouver. So, you know, it's this quick kind of trying to get myself composed, get off the plane with my coworker and we end up having the hour long, uh, drive out to Chilliwack from Vancouver, even stop for lunch. 
um, went and said, you know, let's just check into our rooms, get together for supper. So I had maybe three hours to myself where I was just kind of laying there, kind of letting my mind wander what's going on. Uh, went for supper the whole bit, went to the conference the next day and sat amongst, you know, a room full of 150 team commanders from, you know, uh, BC, Mount Ontario in between as well. And never let on to anybody what was going on, but I was a mess. I, I had no rhyme or reason to what I was doing. It, things just didn't make sense at that point. That night ended up going back into Vancouver because I had a hotel before we flew out the next morning. And I was at the hotel in Richmond and I couldn't sleep. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't be alone, couldn't be in my room. I was wandering the streets of Richmond until about three o'clock in the morning, which I found out isn't the smartest thing to do, but, uh, you know, it, it kept me out of my room, kept me, uh, you know, in the monks kind of the public, right. Finally crash and uh, basically crashed and burned that night. Uh, I was just exhausted, woke up in the morning and it was like an epiphany. It was, you know, it came to me, it was, this is the baby, you know, this is the baby call. And that was it. And I knew at, at that point from, you know, my, my past kind of training and life in social work, I started making phone calls and I was, you know, making desperate phone calls as I'm trying to get myself ready for my flight in a couple of hours. I was lucky enough to get connected with the right people who directed me to the right agency and the right psychologist that, by the time I left for the airport, I had my first session booked with a psychologist the following Tuesday. So it, it was, you know, kind of the perfect storm of PTSD coming out and me making sure that I had at least one resource ready to go. The trauma of that call involving the child. I mean, we, we you and I can both kind of understand why this happened because uh, we understand how these these things later surface. When did that incident happen? 2012. 2012. And you're now, or no, just wait, sorry. No, not uh, 20, 2006. Sorry. Yeah. 2006. Was, and when did it, it start coming out? 12 years. 12. So 12 years later. Amazing. 2018. And, yeah. and that beach ball, as you push it down, you're very right, Jay, you, you will lose that battle. It's just a matter of time. And for every first responder that's out there, you've had at least one call that will impact you. That will be that beach ball that you're trying to push down that will come roaring back out at you and, uh, and force you to deal with it head on. Finally, you cannot run from these, these experiences. So did you, did you have anyone you were working with, uh, as far as a psychologist up till that point? Nope, not at all. I uh, had nobody that I was working with, nobody that I was talking to didn't have a need for it. Right. It was just kind of the normal work stresses that you're going through. You don't think of anything, but at that point it was, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I made, I think it was three phone calls, um, that were able to get me put in touch with the psychologist that I ended up having for the next three years. And she was, a she was a game changer for me in so many ways. And, you know, when you think of, your, your journey with PTSD, it, it's so important to find those right players for yourself as soon as you can, because they will make the difference. And, and, you know, she did in my, my case for sure, but it, that was just the start of it. And then, you know, as we started kind of unwrapping or kind of peeling back the onion, you, you realize just how much you're caring and how much was there. The unfortunate thing that I saw, because I was a, a, I almost consider myself to be a later generation to you. I joined in 07. And for my generation that came in and the generations that are now going into the Mounties, I've seen a very big shift in how we approach the career. I think a lot of people now are accepting that you are going to see some very difficult things and you should start talking about this and putting your team together very early on and not doing it the way you've done it, right? Where all of a sudden now you're you're into your 15 plus years of policing and you have this massive beach ball that you've just, it's going to take you years to be able to safely even let that come to the surface with a psychologist. And that's the unfortunate part too about that older generation is 
there wasn't really any talk or support about, okay, go out and start assembling that care team, you know, outside of work so that you can start to deal with some of the things that you're experiencing while at work. Uh, at the same time, Jay, did, were you struggling at home at all? Like, cause I know a lot of people they reference to like when they were at work, they were okay. They could control everything, but it was when they usually were at home where they struggled the most right in their own environment. I think one of the things I noticed for myself, like in hindsight, it, there was an increase of irritability. Like things were would bother me. The the um, loud sounds, um, unexpected kind of noises, the the startled reactions. Those ones really got to me um, earlier on before I even kind of realized what was happening. And that's what I mean. Like the. The, my time in national security, I think, was when the door kind of really opened, um, was kind of all the textbook symptoms were going on at that point, right? I had the nightmares. I had the isolation, withdrawing from situations, um, intrusive thoughts, all of the stuff, irritability, everything was there. But denial is so much stronger, right? Especially... Right. Denial no, I, brings in acceptance too, right? We we know that we're going through a tough time. And I know this was from my own experience. I was going and I was struggling and I was doing all of these things. And I was at the same time bred to believe that I was Mountie strong, right? That I could continue to push through all this stuff, right? So denial and acceptance kind of go hand in hand. So it's hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you you know, for myself, because I was at that point where I was starting to get those things that I was after career wise, right? I was starting to get that kind of, um, you know, I'll say ego stroke, stroke where, you know, you're becoming the primary, you're becoming kind of that looked upon member, start promoting, moving up the ladder, all those things really play on it. And it makes it even that much harder to recognize and acknowledge that there's things going, going wrong with you, right? Because how to how will anybody in that situation get promoted? How will anybody in that situation be trusted to move up? Right? We've, we've all seen what happens when someone goes off sick um, for mental health. Right? It, it's not a pretty sight in the you know the background on what's going on with the comments and, and way people are approaching it. I I got to the point where it was probably six to eight months before the incident on the plane that I was having panic attacks every morning driving into work and had this feeling like I was going through a heart attack where my chest was tightening and, you know, the elephant sitting on it. Now I look back on it and I'm like, well, that was a clear sign. But for me, I rationalized it as, you know, I must be, uh, my diet must be off or I must be, you know, my vitamins and minerals might be messing up or kind of interacting with each other wrong. So all these pieces I'm looking at kind of thinking it's something external that I'm doing to myself that's causing this to happen. Not that it was completely internal in my own processing and realizing I don't want to go to work. I'm afraid of work, you know. One of the things I didn't understand either until after retirement was when as a young Mountie, I was always excited because every posting was three to four years and you could move right and now i look back and i go what an unhealthy way to deal with this stuff right you're you're basically promoting changing environments but creating more trauma and never really dealing with some of the stuff you go through and you see so many mounties who have you know 10 10 transfers in their their careers and instead of dealing with their stuff they just keep looking for the next opportunity to transfer out right so we all hit those points where now we're becoming irritable and we've maybe got the panic attacks and maybe there's some substance abuse going on at the same time and all of the ptsd symptoms are there and instead of actually acknowledging that we're dealing with ptsd we go i just need a transfer I just need a, a change of environment. I'll go somewhere else. It'll get better. Denial, denial is a powerful thing. And, and that's what that is. It, you know, I'd rather change my physical location and have to sit down and talk about myself. And that, it, yeah. 
Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it's not something you realize until you retire where you go, okay, hold on. The Mounties actually, they're very aware as to the issues that happen with their people. And it's almost like the system is designed to keep the environment changing around you so that hopefully you can be able to have the longevity built into your career. Now, how this needs to be done needs to shift. Absolutely. We need to support our people a lot better. We need to change the way things are done. Uh, but for you, before we dive too deep into kind of now where you're at with, uh, getting help officially you said there was one incident you wanted to talk about that might lend into you now dealing with ptsd did we cover that already jay yeah it was just the fact that you know my ptsd came out from an incident 12 years after the fact yes so it, it's not you know that misconception that's there and it, it's with members it's with the general public is that when you encounter a traumatic experience, you're going to have the impact of it right away. In some cases, yes, that does happen, you know, depending on the nature of it. In the first responder world, because we are geared to keep on fighting and pushing forward and win at all costs, we push those things down so so fast, right? We, we don't want them there. So to say that you know, one incident in your policing career is what caused it. No, it, it's what brought it out. It's not what caused it. And it might bring it out years after the fact, right? It, it's not necessarily a one and done situation. But there are those cases where it is. Like, I, I'm not going to deny that because, you know, you, you think of the traumatic shootings, um, those type of one incident situations that can have a lasting impact and an immediate impact as well. Absolutely. You're totally true. It, it's a death by a thousand cuts with a lot of big trauma built into it. And eventually your day will come where you just have to face, face the piper, so to speak. Now that you're facing this realization that the plane ride in the scenes of the child in that movie have pushed you towards, okay, there's something here. There's a very real trigger here and everything is starting to come out. What was your experience like now that you're reaching out and finally sitting down and getting the help and putting this together and you're slowly starting to look at, okay, how do I not deny anymore, but move to what is this? How do we, how do we fix this? I, I think there's two things that I did um, after that kind of breakout moment with my PTSD is one, I called my wife, uh, from the airport in BC, Vancouver. I called her and told her that I'm coming home and told her that I'm coming home broken. Um, just so that she knew what to expect because I didn't know what to expect at that moment. Um, getting on that plane um, was a unbelievably scary thing to be doing because the first time I was on a plane, things didn't work out for me. And so I was concerned as to what might happen on the way back. <clears throat> but that that was the, the one thing that I, I think really set this differently for me is that I didn't hide from it anymore. I, I brought my wife in right away and told her, this is this is what I'm dealing with. The, the next thing that I did, which kind of really set the tone is I uh, got public with it. I sent an email to family and friends and I posted on Facebook um, and I ripped back the curtain. Um, there was going to be no hiding for me. This was not something I was ashamed of. It was something that was a result of my career and my, uh, my choice to serve. And I wanted to make sure that people were aware what I was dealing with. Um, not just for myself, but for my family as well, because there's lots that were going on. And it, it actually was probably one of the, the most beneficial thing because as I did my journey, I was able to be open about it with people and I didn't shy away from it. I didn't feel the full kind of impact of the stigma from it because I didn't allow myself to, uh, I wasn't ashamed of it. Um, and I think that's a, that's a key thing that kind of helped me, especially when therapy started going because I'd openly say, yeah, I'm going to therapy today. I, I didn't hide it. I, I, you know, people would ask, you know, do you want to meet up for coffee? And I'd be like, well, no, I can't. I actually have to, you know, I have my appointment with my psychologist from this time. So it, it really helped that piece. And it opened up me to being able to sit there and open up and just start sharing because that's what I had to do at this point. 
I personally did it very differently for a number of years. I tried to quietly deal with it outside of work so that it didn't impact my career. Cause I started actually dealing with my own PTSD quite early on. Like I would say maybe three to five years in, I was now reaching out being like, Hey, why do I feel this way? Why am I not sleeping well? Why am I getting irritable? Why is my compassion leaving? You know, what's, what does this all mean? Uh, so for me, from the onset of having to deal with it, I didn't, I was bending from the stress and I was trying to stay healthy. Uh, So I kind of also quietly tried to deal with it. And that theme went on for, for basically my entire career. It wasn't until I came out and started podcasting where I was like, Hey, I'm Nate. I'm a retired police officer with post-traumatic stress. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff we go through. Boom. Here I am. I'm on social media now. And I can honestly say that you are right in this approach, that this approach for many people, while it maybe isn't, right for some people in the beginning they just can't get past that point but when you can finally remove the veil and just show up as who as as you are and say yeah this is what i've been through there's no shame and that's how you kill the shame too right and the guilt that's behind all of this because we hold on to that stuff too because of our experiences so yes i would say an end goal for many people is to get to a place where you finally have the comfort to say hey this is what i'm dealing with let's openly deal with it together as a community and i don't know what your experience has been since like obviously opening up um but for me personally my own experience i have been met with nothing but love and compassion and that has and that helps the healing so much more than trying to hide this stuff and deal with it on your own. Yeah. Like there's kind of two kind of like silos, let's say of reactions, you know, one is that kind of personal life silo that you have where out and about your friends, family that are, aren't police related neighbors, whoever they are, they, when they hear PTSD because of how it's presented in the media, you know, it's, they think, oh, this is suicide, right? And they right away, you know, feel sorry for you and and give you that attention and give you that kind of comfort. And if you need anything, just let us know and we'll help you really uh, an outpouring of love. With the kind of other silo of the work life, it's hit and miss on what you get work-wise. Some people see you as a mirror where they don't want to look at you because they're in that same spot and they're afraid to find out, right? Just how far along they are. There's some people in that work setting that definitely do give you that love and support, but it's a real mixed bag on that side. I agree with you on that as well. I saw more of a removing the veil in my own personal life once I was finally on the outside of the Mounties. So I was very openly met with love and compassion. But yeah, as I reflect on even my own journey with PTSD, there was definitely some people I could talk to about post-traumatic stress. And there were a lot of people I couldn't talk to. Because as soon as you try to like, you know, hey, you know, you go through this, you know, are you very irritable? Are you struggling with sleep? Whatever the case is, you try to, you know, put the feelers out to see where someone's at. Most times it would get shut down, right? People are just in a complete state of denial and they're like, no, 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 we're Mountie strong. We're going to keep pushing through this. Uh, There must be something wrong with you. (laughs) Not me, but you, (laughs) right? So I, again, I agree with you there too, where in the workplace, that needs to be more of a shift as well. But again, We can only control what we can control. So your journey now into PTSD, you obviously had to learn what it was, how it was impacting you, and how do you find the way out? Well, there is, you know, for me, I look at my journey, my healing journey, there is a couple of kind of... um, I don't want to say benchmarks, but there there was a couple of kind of events that happened that really set the tone for me kind of in my recovery. The first one was normalization that what I experienced was messed up, right? And that simply was me doing a trauma narrative, sitting, talking in detail about this baby death and the interpretation, everything that was going on, like, you know, just as well as I do, the, the worst and the best part about PTSD is that you have a photo, 
graphic memory of whatever trauma it is that you are thinking about in that moment. So I was able to bring in all these details, everything that was going on. I'm bawling my eyes out during this session and everything became normal and, and kind of okay for me when I looked over and my psychologist was bawling her eyes out too. It, it just made me feel that, okay, this is okay. This, this is messed up. This just makes sense why I'm feeling this way. So that was the the first kind of part of my journey where, you know, and it, and it also was trusting for the first time again, it, you know, being able to say what was on my mind and what I was experiencing without fear that I was going to be ridiculed or put down or, you know, stigmatized for not being able to handle myself. It, it was very, very much that kind of, Con- unconditional acceptance at that point that you know that's messed up you're messed up because of it we're going to work together i'm here for you trust me i'm not going to lead you astray Let- let's get this going so that that was the first kind of part about it and that really opened up the rest of therapy for me of starting to kind of being able to open up to everything else and as you start kind of unpackaging that onion you know you start finding out just how many layers there are more than you maybe even expected. And I, you know, that was a big one. The next one that really kind of helped me move forward was I was able to get into a program, a residential program. It was a a six day experiential programming. Um, And that program helped me normalize things even further because it introduced me into the peer world and it was important because I hit my bottom there in realizing how big my traumas were, how much I had collected because I was sitting in a room with other first responders and military personnel and they would tell a story of their trauma and I could match it. Something, you know, similar. And we're talking about Afghan vets that were telling stories about stuff. And from my policing career, there was examples that would match some of the stuff that they had experienced. And I remember at the end of it, I, uh, I'm sitting there and I'm just sobbing. Like I, I realize I'm a crier apparently, but I'm just bawling my eyes out after everybody that they're sharing. And uh, the executive director of the program asked me, uh, what's the matter? And I just said, I just realized how fucked up I am. And that was, you know, almost a year into therapy where I really hit this kind of point where, yeah, you collected a lot more than you think you ever did. And it was a turning point or kind of that benchmark because at that point I started kind of really opening up to how much was there and the impact of it and where it, it was taking me away from the person I wanted to be and how I was handling it. The last one was that peer support piece. Um, I got very involved in peer support after that program. And that was a game changer for me because I started to see how that connection can, you know, really make a difference for a lot of people because we, we go into this kind of journey with PTSD thinking that we're an island unto ourselves and that nobody else knows what we're dealing with. But when you're sitting across from a group of peers and they're all saying the exact same thing, you start realizing really quickly, you're not alone. There's other people that are dealing with this. And that helped immensely. Like for me, I think that is really one of the things that kept on propelling this idea of acceptance of kind of my situation and it was also played off of by my psychologist because you know she she understood that aspect of it of the struggle that we put ourselves into and it really did change how you know the last year and a half of my therapy went because the focus changed I, I began kind of looking at things not as why did this happen or you know the the negativity of it i was looking at okay this happened what can i learn from it what what is this teaching me what do i have to to know about myself from this and i got to the point in uh 
in the peer support world, at the end of it, we always did gratitude. And uh, we would talk, you know, what are you grateful for? And I would always say my wife and my, my son, I'm grateful for my family because they, they put up with me during this piece. But then I also really started saying this and I believe it full heartedly. And to this day, it's one of the things that I'm grateful for. And that's my PTSD. Um, it, it's you and I had this chat before, so you're not kind of shocked by this, but it really is. That became kind of something that I started treasuring is that I was grateful for my PTSD because not PTSD in general, it's the crappiest thing in the world for people to have to experience because it's, you know, the, uh, uninvited party guest that will never leave. But when you start seeing your PTSD and what you have gained from it, that is gratitude because I wouldn't have had three years uninterrupted with a psychologist to dig out anything and everything that was kicking around in my head about work, about life in general and how the two were mingling and, and not dancing properly together. It, it just taught me so much about myself. So I have to be grateful for it. And then when you do that little simple act of finding something about it that you can be grateful for, it starts changing it as well. You're not seeing PTSD as this big, bad boogeyman that's out to get you. You start seeing it as something a little bit different. It, it truly is an injury that you have. It's something that has happened to you because of your experiences. And you can start understanding it and working with it. I wholeheartedly agree. <clears throat> At one point in your journey, when you don't understand PTSD, it's an anchor. It's sucking you down. But eventually over time, once you actually allow and accept yourself to be a part of the process of having to deal with and talk about these, these traumatic things that we experience, you begin to become lighter. Uh, <clears throat> your story is very important because you highlight how, how linear the path is in PTSD and how simple it is. The recipe for success isn't really that hard for PTSD. And once we finally stop denying and we allow ourselves the opportunity to see our trauma, to fully seal it, and this was one of the big things you reflected on, was now allowing yourself to remove the layers and see it and go, okay, that's actually not normal what I went through and I need to talk about it and how it's impacted me. And now you add in this layer of group therapy and you're now sitting down with other people that you can trust and you can connect with and you can say, Hey, let's connect over this so that I'm not alone. Because again, if you don't do that, it's a very socially isolating issue that you have to face. PTSD will drive you to a point where you, you remove people from your support system because you feel like you're alone and that you're the only one going through this. Like you even referenced walking around, around in Richmond until three in the morning, not wanting to be alone and just wandering and looking for connection and not being able to find anyone. And that's, <clears throat> that's how brutal of a space this can, can be at times. Now, Again, with the right support systems in place, you can navigate through PTSD and understand it and learn it and start connecting with people again and bringing back the positive emotions and all these beautiful things that are going to help combat or at least process the, the PTSD, what makes up the PTSD and gain so many gifts back. And the beautiful thing too I love about your story is the fact that you've been able to now shift from PTSD being an anchor and recognizing that it's actually something that can, if you challenge your perspective in time, when you begin to heal in it, you can see that inner strength and that courage in the bravery it takes to be able to step out in front of even now in a podcast and just say, Hey, here is my story. Here is what I went through. Here are some of the challenges that I had going on at the time and how I recognize that I was falling apart and I had to call my wife on that phone or on that plane ride coming home and say, you, you, what you're getting when I come home is a broken individual. I need to put myself back together. Uh, and these kind of stories is exactly how we get to the other side of PTSD where we can now look back on it and have that post-traumatic growth. So I couldn't be more proud of you, Jay, for being open and vulnerable to sharing your story, not only here, but just in your life so that you can gain your health back. I see so many people, and I'm sure you do too, who some, there are some people who never get to that post-traumatic growth phase. Mm -hmm. hey, it's, um, 
people talk about post-traumatic growth and it's almost like it's an enigma, right? Like, what is it? How, you know, what is it going to be? What's the experience like, you know, thinking that they're going to become like, you know, some Zen master floating when they hit this growth piece, but really, you know, break it down to its simplest growth with PTSD is being able to do something that you weren't able to do because of your suffering and enjoy it, right? Whether that is spending time with your child, whether that is being able to go out in public, whether that is being able to sit, do a podcast, whatever it is, that piece is growth. Anytime you change and you challenge yourself, even if you have those difficult thoughts, feelings, and emotions that are showing up, that you're still going to go ahead and do it because it's important to you, that is growth. And one of the big parts about it is first recognizing and ending the denial. Like we've talked about it before as well, you and I back and forth, the biggest thing for a lot of first responders with PTSD is this idea that I have to fight it, right? Like I am going to fight this disease. I'm going to fight this situation. I'm going to give you an analogy that is going to show how wrong that approach is. Okay. PTSD is an injury. It it is an injury that is suffered in our brains, right? You can, uh, if you query PET scan PTSD, you will see uh, a vivid image of two brains, one that's a normal functioning brain and one that's a PTSD brain. They do not look the same anymore, right? If you could, with what you're seeing in that PTSD brain, you would wrap it up with a band-aid and give it some crutches to move around, right? That, that is, it's an injury. There's no doubt about it. How that injury manifests, we can get to in a second. So here's the analogy. You're working. You step in a hole, you break your ankle. You're not going to get up and keep on walking on it and pretend that everything's all right. You're not going to be the knight who says knee, right? You know, oh, it's just a flesh wound. I can keep on going. No, that broken ankle is going to take you down, right? It's going to stop you. And you're going to go to the hospital. You're going to get x-rayed. You're going to get at least some type of mobilization done on it, more than likely a walk, like a cast, maybe surgery, depending on it. And then you're going to be in crutches and you're going to be hobbling around doing all those pieces on crutches. And then you're maybe going to transfer to a walking boot. You're going to start physiotherapy. You're going to start working through some of this stuff. You haven't fought any part of that. You've accepted, I broke my ankle. I've got to get surgery. I got to do this. I got to use crutches. I got to have a cast. I got to go to physio. I got to learn how to walk again slowly. Then I can maybe start jogging lightly on a treadmill at the physio. And then I can start running outside on my own and then doing uneven ground. We don't fight any of that. We don't deny that we're injured. Why the hell are we doing it with PTSD, which is exactly the same type of injury, but to our brain. Takes a lot to change the way we've been doing it for years. We thought that this was the way that we should be doing it. And only until you go through this or you, you know, you have the education behind you. But yeah, I have to absolutely agree. There is no fighting in PTSD. If you want to call it fighting, go ahead. But you literally have to do what you just said. You have to fully accept and throw yourself into, you know, the arms of others and trust the people that are around you, your support system to say, okay, this is what you need to do next to work on all of these different symptoms that you're experiencing. Now for you, you've done just that. You were tired. And I want to talk quickly about that kind of how that all came to be with your journey into into dealing with PTSD and when you knew your time was was done. Um, yeah, so I went off on May 1st, 28. Right? I think my uh, first 2135 was like May 3rd or whatever. Um, May 3rd, 2018. I went back to work to try a return to work in January, February of uh, 2019. And I made it to August 2nd of 2019, at which point I went off again for the last time. 
um, I was being impacted by what is now known as sanctuary trauma. Um, things that were happening in the police, like in the, the RCMP, uh, behind the scenes, um, by people that were supposed to be there to help me, but they weren't. And I was pushed to the point where I had to make a choice of, you know, my mental health and well being or a career. And I give complete credit to my psychologist for this one because she asked me this question and it really kind of put it in perspective. And she said, if you were in a relationship where you were being treated the way the RCMP was treating you, what would you do? And I said, I'd leave. And she said, I think you know your answer then. And then we, you know, that that prompted a couple of months of us kind of talking about, you know, what does that look like? What do you mean leave? What What is that all about? And, you know, we, we started really kind of working on it and we were hoping, um, to get a meeting with uh, the people that had to get involved with because I was intent on returning. I, I knew though that I wasn't going to be in the same function that I was, but I figured I could do something different. And we kept on that piece and it got to the point where that meeting kept on getting delayed and delayed or not talked about and delayed. So as part of my kind of approach, I started going back to school. I, I went back to school to upgrade my education in hopes that I'm going to market myself to the RCMP now with more education, that I'm going to be more, more of a desirable person for them. You know, having gone through this, I might be of help. <clears throat> and then December 2nd of 2020, um, the meeting was supposed to happen and I received notice a, a week before that it was canceled. Uh, and this was a meeting to kind of put a, a definitive return to work plan in place to get me back working. Uh, I ref I call it the the most satisfying disappointment of my life because I was disappointed that the the true reality came out um, that I was not someone that the RCMP was interested in maintaining in an employment situation, and it was satisfying because the RCMP revealed that I was not someone that they were interested in having in an employment situation. It, it gave me the acceptance that I need to end this relationship. And that really was the decision. Um, I had kind of hung on to that last part of that struggle long enough. That was the time for me to accept it and move on. And I think too, the way you frame it, I just want to be careful with how you frame it because I don't want to paint a picture that you were an undesirable employee here at all. Like we can all tell that you were very, uh, very much valued throughout your service. And now all of a sudden, when you get to a point where you're now facing these these shifts where management management gets a little funny right around PTSD and their people and return to works and stuff. So this definitely isn't about you being uh non-valued by the Mounties. But where where you are highlighting this very real issue is a lot of times there's really not the support and compassion behind someone who's trying to come back to work or explore coming back to work, which actually negatively impacts their ability to come back to work or the progress that they're making in their own mental health, right through the PTSD journey. And that was something I very much learned too, when I was going through my harassment complaint, at the same time of trying to deal with my post traumatic stress was that there's not really a lot of organizational support there for people uh, to come back to work and process some of the harder things that, you know, they've been through. So a lot of times the Mounties just kind of want to keep things quiet and, you know, brush things under the rug and forgive and forget, or maybe just forget. I'm not sure, but it's not a healthy way for people. So you actually saw that and you actually use that as an opportunity to, <clears throat> pursue your own self self worth. And I mean, that's kind of the beauty too. And even my own story is, I finally saw kind of how the Mounties saw my self worth and how I saw my own and they didn't align anymore. And I think that for me, that sounds very much true to what your story is as well. Jay, do you agree? Yeah. And I, I think it actually reminded me, I think one of our first kind of interactions online was after I had posted. Um, so I graduated with my master's from Laurier. And part of that is you know, 
I had made the decision to be leaving the RCMP at that point. My, you know, I'm changing careers. I'm looking at doing something different. And for the longest time, I believed that my self-worth wasn't there because I had PTSD and the RCMP, you know, weren't equipped to kind of deal with me. But then I posted a, a letter that I received where I was, you know, uh, awarded the Medal of Academic Excellence for my marks. You know, I, I was an A plus student in grad studies. And I think that was one of our first kind of back and forth online after that, where that was a moment for the first time in 20 years, externally, someone said, you're good. You know, you're, you've got a very strong self-worth and you've just shown it with your studies. <clears throat> and that, no, and that, that's a game changer because you, you start seeing things differently. And, and that's where you start realizing how much we take on to try to keep this persona of being a Mountie or, or being in law enforcement when it's damaging. Yeah, the self-limiting beliefs, all that stuff that comes in over time, right? It, it's very much there. And I think to a lot of times people will stay longer in their service because they tell themselves this narrative, well, I don't have skills, I don't have transferable attributes, whatever the case is. I'm not going to be able to find a job elsewhere. I have no self-worth, no self-value, so I can't just leave. So I got to stay in this environment and eventually stay sick or continue to get worse. Uh, and that couldn't be more further from the truth. You can leave, you can build a life outside of the Mounties and thrive. And you, Jay, are doing just that. So where are you now in your life? Like, what are you doing with uh, with your life, this part of the chapter? And what have you learned about this? Well, so I started as a uh, social worker in uh, February of 2021. So before I retired. I was able to get the uh, exemption for dual employment. So I started working as a, a therapist, working with people, and then got to the point where I knew that, you know, I wanted to kind of take this further. So I opened up my own practice and, and now it's a partnership with two other therapists. But, you know, I saw my first independent uh, client, you know, July 8th of uh, 2021. And started from there. And now we have our own brick and mortar location. Definitely kind of a combination of clients that I'm seeing. It's just, it's been a nice progression and a kind of a nice transition into something that is filling my bucket on a daily basis. I, I, I've told people in conversation, my worst day as a therapist so far has been better than my best day as a police officer. You just, uh, it's a, it's a different world. And when you are living kind of your values and living who you want to be on a daily basis, helping people, it, it changes your life. It changes the, your perspective on things. It, it just, it concretized everything that I started learning about myself and PTSD in that journey. Now I'm seeing kind of where it's taken me and I love it. When one of the things I love about your story too, is you, we've talked over, you know, the months leading up to this point, you highlight how you've naturally kind of just fallen into a place now, which is your passion. Like you finally found your passion in life, which is helping others and giving them the tools that need, they need in your own journey. And what a powerful position too, even for you, for having had gone through all of this and now being able to sit down with someone and say, I've been there. What a beautiful way to lend back and give that, that helping hand. Uh, so for you, like what, what do you notice now in your seat as a, uh, as a therapist, more or less, can I call you a therapist? Yeah, sure. I've been called Perfect. worse. <laughs> Perfect. What do you see now when you tell your, your clients or can you tell your clients, Hey, I've been there. I've been in your shoes. Well, I, I, uh, I make no bones about it. I don't hide it. I, I tell clients right up front. I'm a lived experience therapist and they, they kind of get this kind of look, what do you mean by lived experience therapist? And I follow up by saying at one point in my life, I lived in the client's chair. And that, as you can tell, is probably from my 20 years in policing that put me in that position for dealing with it. And I am open in that that experience has helped me be a therapist because it made me understand which approaches I like to use, what modalities make the most sense for me, how I can, 
you know, use my own experiences and bring in examples from those to help kind of explain something that's going on for a person. And how do you find that's received by the client? Um, for the most part, it, it's, it, it helps with us connecting, it, you know, because I'm human. I'm not some expert. I'm not going to be able to solve the problems, but what I can do is I can help you understand why you're having a problem with this and give you some ideas on things that you can do. Some of them might've worked for me, but, you know, give you ideas on things that you can do to move forward with this. It, it goes back to like, it really, you know, the whole approach that I've taken as a therapist really talks about and speaks to this idea of recognizing when you're in a struggle, right? Whatever that thought, feeling, or emotion is that has come up and has captivated your attention and has taken you away from the things that are important to you, that's a struggle. The sooner you recognize those struggles and accept that I can't do anything about this one because it's outside of my control, or maybe I should try something different to to do this. Once you get to that point, you've got it made. You can start really moving forward and changing how you're seeing things. But the longer you stay in that struggle and with PTSD, it's, it's so much, you know, so dangerous that if you stay in that struggle for so long, it starts eroding more and more of you and it starts chipping away even more of what you had. And that self-worth just becomes less and less and less. And it, and it, it it's, it's vicious. As long as you're struggling, it's vicious. As soon as you stop struggling with your PTSD and recognize it, that you're injured and you got to get help and give yourself that time to, to rest and recuperate and recover, it's the game changer. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that as well. Uh, one of the most brilliant things I ever heard uh, while falling victim to the YouTube rabbit hole was, I think it was Jordan Peterson said this, when you go through these struggles, you know, mental health, PTSD, whatever the case is, uh, it eventually will ruin you. It'll wash away all of the good that you possess, all of the good personalities, the the behavioral patterns, all of that stuff, and it'll bring out the worst in you. Now you have actually challenged yourself to do the complete opposite of that. And one of the things that we talked about in the very beginning before we hit record for this, this episode was one of the things that you hold close to your heart, and you've touched on this a little bit through this, this, this podcast was the acceptance piece and the denial and the control and I think too, even for myself, as I reflect on my own journey, when things weren't well for me, I was not accepting of where I was and willing to remove the denial. And I was still trying to control everything. What have you learned, Jay, from all of this now, from the seat that you're in now about acceptance and control and the balance of that? When we get caught up in trying to control things it, it that's your struggle right when you know i don't want someone to see me cry what do we do we start struggling with it right i i don't want to have this feeling of sadness so i'm going to try to push it away i don't want to be angry that's why I, I try to push it away oh there's happiness i'm going to hold on to that well fuck, where did it go right that's what, you know, when we're talking about acceptance and, it, you know, maybe it's a good point to make clear is that we're not talking about, you know, that everything you just accept it, right? That you, you just kind of uh, agree to accept stuff just for the sake of accepting it so that you don't have to, you know, struggle with it. When you accept stuff, you accept that I'm going to have this emotion and it's okay, right? And you notice how I didn't say this bad emotion because, we put that label on this stuff, right? We say that anger is bad or that sadness is bad. Happiness is good. We put this label on it and that becomes our struggle because I don't want to have this bad emotion of anger show up. Well, why are you getting angry? What is it? That's acceptance of, okay, anger is here. Now I've got two things I can do with it. I can either get caught up in it and all the thoughts that are associated with it, which are usually pretty negative slanted, right? Our minds are great that way. It's a reason giving machine. If you want to have a, a reason why you're angry, you know, do a little Google search in your brain. Reasons why I'm angry. Well, 50,000 hits right away show up of here's why you should be angry. 
and they go from any time when you were three years of age to the present day. Most of them are completely wonky because you got the you know misconceptions going on or you read the perceptions wrong or they're out of context. Acceptance is saying, hey, you know what? Okay, anger is here. Why is it here? What is it here to teach me? What am I here to learn from it? Why did I get angry in the first place? And that's acceptance. That's saying, I'm going to have difficult thoughts, feelings, and emotions showing up throughout the day. I can accept that because just like a cloud in the sky, they're going to go past. Clouds never stay in one spot unless you're in BC, you know, during the rainy season. But for the most part, you have, you know, these emotions that will come and go. Accept that they're coming and going. Don't try to hold on to one or push them away. That's the struggle right away. You know, it, it, it sounds really simplistic because it is. You know, we get into this idea that the, the idea of we got to fight, we got to fight. And I told you before, and I told others, that's the indoctrination process of policing or being a first responder. They're taking someone who, you know, yesterday was on the street as Joe Blow and getting them to a point where they're going in and dealing with all these situations. Part of it is the hardening and the toughening up and kind of pushing your emotions to the back so that you're stoic in those moments. And there's this misconception of being stoic. Being stoic doesn't mean that you take on all this stuff and you aren't human. When you read about stoicism and what it was talked about, it was acceptance. It was understanding what you're facing and making the choice to either allow it to control you or you take control by saying, I'm going to move forward. One of the most beautiful things I ever learned about my anger, and that was something that I struggled with uh, when I was at rock bottom, was that my anger caused an issue with my behaviors in the beginning. And then I had to challenge myself of why does my anger cause me issues? Where is it coming from? What is it actually trying to teach me? And something you've also touched on that's very, very powerful is the childhood trauma. Most of us actually have this and still deny that as well. It wasn't until I finally saw my childhood trauma and was able to realize why my perspective was the way it was that would lead me to getting angry in certain situations, right? Because you also talked about that, right? Misconstruing the facts of things that are happening in front of you and our brains are the most powerful things in our bodies but at the same time it's this little hard uh, hard drive that's always recording and it's always trying to you know tell you or nudge you okay this was you know not a very good situation for you let's try to remember this and maybe we'll call on anger to help defeat this the next time and your anger once you get to a place of you know starting to heal or healing in PTSD you can see where your anger comes from and you can now challenge it and it's not that you're removing it at that point, but you're actually starting to go, okay, why do I have anger? What do I need to do to accept what's happening here so that my anger doesn't surface again? Because I'm actually creating a false emotion here for something that doesn't require anger. And I mean, this goes very, very deep into, you know, the inner workings that you have to do with, you know, the inner child and all that stuff. And I don't think we're going to have time to, to dive into childhood trauma and the inner child and all of these complex things. But it's very true and it's a very real part of PTSD as well. I think... Like, I don't know if we can even touch on this real quick, but do you do a lot of childhood, childhood trauma work with your clients as well? Well, one of the, one of the things that I present, um, because I talk about trauma and I, I talk about little T traumas and the way I phrase traumas is I use the analogy of a backpack. And as we go through life, we start picking up these little pebbles and stones of various sizing, right? And that's the different types of traumas that we have. We keep on loading them up into our backpack. And we have that backpack from the time we were born until the time we die. So anything that happens, you know, in our life, we're putting these little stones in this backpack and it's eventually getting too heavy to carry. And that's when we start kind of losing some of them. And we, you know, kind of go to therapy for the first time, let's say, or start processing it. Dr. Bruce Perry is one of the foremost expect, experts in childhood traumas. And he has a very 
wide definition of trauma, basically that is anything that happens to a child that causes an unwanted reaction or response, right? So when you think about that, that that's the child that was learning how to ride a bike and fell off the bike and instead of getting nurturing, gets yelled at because they scraped the bike. You know, that's a trauma. And if, you know, people say, well, I don't have trauma for my childhood. Yeah, you do. That, you know, that happened to you. That's a trauma. If you played sports and you're ever told in a, you know, in a game or or practice that you're not good enough to be on the team, that's a trauma. Those are those things that we're collecting and they will mess you up if you aren't dealing with them, right? Those are the ones that you're holding on to eventually that are going to be the catalyst for problems down the road, especially when you're looking at PTSD. Those are some of those things that governed why we stayed in the fight so long because we wanted that recognition. We wanted that brotherhood or that kind of family approach to being in the first responder world. It was filling so many parts of our lives that maybe weren't met before. When that starts eroding, that's why it's so difficult. That's why the denial is there. That's why the struggle is there because we don't want to let go of it because we think it's actually doing us good when in fact it's doing us bad. I agree. To the point where you've stumped me on that one. <laughs> you know what? And that's... We, we, And we see that so often with so many partner, uh, like uh, past partners, right? People that just continue to drive forward and drive forward and, you know, 30, 40 years into service, like you've given so much of yourself and you are so far gone that it's going to take you years to come back to find that healthy side of you again. Um, Jay, you've been an absolute honor to have on this podcast, an absolute honor. I can't think of anyone that has come through so much adversity in their life and has gotten to a point now where you're a professional, you're retired, and you're in a different space, but you're helping people put their lives back together. And that is the beautiful part about this story is, yes, when you heal from PTSD, you have to challenge yourself now how to give back to the community in some way, and you have done just that. So I applaud you for where you sit in your journey. I thank you for that. I, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to touch on before we end, and that is a mutual friend of us, our, of ours said, you know, a, a topic that she would have or wanted to kind of throw out there was taking a step back. Is there anything that looks different to you now or that you can see more clearly? And oh, that was the question that was posed to me. And when I think about it, it seems like it's a huge question to try to answer. And I answered it really quick with one word and we're going to give you that one word. And it's, you know, anything that looks different to you now or that you can see more clearly and that's living. My life, my day-to-day life is completely different than how it was before my PTSD, even before my policing career. It's more aligned with, who I was beforehand, it's changed. I don't see the negativity anymore the same way. I don't see the struggles the same way. Just life is so much better. I think for even myself, I chased trying to get back to who I was before being a police officer for many, many years. And I'm sure that's something that you see even in your practice. But I think for me, having to recognize that I will never be that person ever again, but the person that I am now, I too have to agree with you. I am more happily rooted in this person because I've learned so much about myself over this journey of PTSD and making the hard work uh, happen daily to getting back to finding, you know, why some of the things I was experiencing or the struggle looked the way it did had finally given me my gift, my freedom from a lot of different things that I was previously struggling with. And I have to absolutely agree with you is that you can now live your life, truly enjoy it lead it with intention and purpose and feel it and find your rhythm and have your boundaries and all of these beautiful things that we all deserve. There's, you know, for me, it's been a year for my retirement and there's times that I 
don't remember being a police officer. It's beautiful when that happens. It, it, oh, absolutely. It, you just kind of have gone, like for me, I, I've gone from that point of identifying as a police officer to, I'm a therapist. I, I you know, and it, it's hard to realize that it's only been a year because it feels like I've been away from policing for a lot longer than that because it's just been a natural progression into just living. You are leading a deeper, more enriched life and the people around you are there for you a hundred percent. I know the people that are around you because I have a few of those people that are around me now as well. And this is how you continue to lead such a healthy life. You build a team of people that are around you that truly care about you. They have the community, the connection, all those beautiful things. Jay, thank you for today so much. It was a true honor to have you on. Thank you, my friend. We will talk again probably. Thank you for joining us on season two. If you are a first responder with an incredible story into post-traumatic stress, please reach out and connect with myself. Season 2 is based on your story. And if you want to step up to the plate and share your story with the world, I would be more than honored to help you do that. Thank you for your continued support with this project, and thank you for tuning in today.